go ahead and call this meeting of the Met Pasco County Metropolitan Planning Organization to order. I was informed that yeah. Mr. Commissioner Mariano is on his way, but we do have a quorum. So go ahead and get started. Can we start with the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance, please? The merciful creator of your hand is open wide to satisfy the needs of every living creature. Make us thankful for your loving providence and grant that we will never be found with that in us and make gifts and make faithful stewards of your good gifts. Amen. 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 I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. And clerk, can we have a roll call, please? Councilman Lance Smith? Here. Mayor Scott Trembley? Mayor Camille Fernandez? Here. Commissioner Ron Oakley? Here. Commissioner Mike Moore? Here. Commissioner Catherine Zerke? Commissioner Mike Wells? Commissioner Jack Mariano? Chairman Jeff Zerke? Here. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move forward to call for public input. If any um, citizens are in the audience that want to comment, make comments to the MPO on items that are not currently on the agenda, now would be the time to do so. Seeing nobody, we'll move forward to approval of uh, meeting minutes from December 11, 2019 and January 9, 2020. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Like sign. Thank you. Um, advisory committee report. Citizens advisory committee. I do not see Marilyn Deshant in the audience today. City. City. Perfect. Mr. Chair, if we could just go over a couple of items sure. before we get into that. Um, so for uh, our March meeting, March 12th, uh, I've sent out an email to the board members about uh, a couple of commissioners are attending a value adjustment meeting on the May, same Real day. quick, is your microphone on? Can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. So uh, next MPO board meeting in Newport Ritchie at 10 o'clock on March 12th. A couple of the commissioners are not able to make that. And so we have booked both 10 o'clock and 1.30 in the afternoon, same day. I want the MPO board to let me know which day do they prefer. Which time? Know, like, for instance, Commissioner Moore won't be able to make the afternoon meeting because you have a meeting back here. On March 12th in the afternoon, so I'm it's gone. we're going to lose. I'm actually out of the county, out of the country. Right. right. Commissioner Oakley won't attend, so we just want to. Uh, oh, yeah. So we're going to lose a commissioner or two, one way or another. Uh, no, Commissioner Mariano said he wants to attend, but if we move it, uh, so just let me know if you want to meet in the morning or. Uh, I personally can do whatever um, pleases the board. I'm right there in Newport. So I think I matter. told you the same. Yes. What was the, what are the two options that you laid out? So it's either going to be at 10 o'clock. We'll miss uh, Commissioner Mariano and Wells who are attending the value adjustment That's meeting. Yeah. Or if we move it to the afternoon, then we'll lose Commissioner Moore because he has a. I, mean, I, I just want to know which one. In the morning, but that's just me. So. I'd rather have it in the morning, but if it, if I can, if we need to move whatever, it. Whatever way you guys need more. I mean, that's what it comes yeah. to. So we have a court. Just let me know which one. I mean, just. Oakley's not going to be here. I'm not right. going to be here. I'll be out of the country. Right. So maybe you can reach out to um, Mayor Tremley and see if he can attend as well. But um, like I said, if 10 o'clock works better for y'all, I'm, I'm absolutely fine with that. Okay. So I guess I'm probably just going to set it up for the afternoon that day. Well, I you think they said the morning. <laughs> the morning. The morning. You want the morning? They want the morning. Yeah. Oh, okay. We prefer awesome. the morning. I think. We, have a, we, we said we have quorum, right? Right. You have right. a quorum right now. Well, there's four. Oh, you're talking about for the March oh, for the March, March meeting. Yeah. We have a. Mm -hmm. Who's the fifth? Uh, Who's the fifth for the March meeting? I think meeting? if we meet March 12th in the morning, we will definitely have a quorum. Well, then. Let's do Here we that. Go. Keep it as is. Yeah. Then, right? Okay. Exactly. And the second item, I guess, at the Board of County Commissioners meeting. Commissioner Wells introduce uh, um, Mr. Clint Wynn to be his representative on the CAC, uh, but it's really not a forum for him to introduce that. It has to be in front of the MPO board. So I've asked his office to maybe have another commissioner bring it up, 
so we can ask uh, to add him as the CSO. I'll make a motion to approve that. That's fine. Second. A motion and a second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, like so? Aye. 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 Welcome, Aye. Commissioner Mariano. Zero. All right, we'll move on then. As, thank you, Manning. To the Citizens Advisory Committee. Sandy Graves, do I need to do my address and all that? I just, yep. you'll accept that. <laughs> okay. It, uh, we met Wednesday, February 5th in Dade City. There was a quorum, but it was noted that some of the cities and districts are not properly represented, and uh, we would like to request that you fill in your vacancy so we can have a full committee. All action items were approved. The consultant from ACOM provided a brief of Vision uh, Zero update. The Cody River Trail study included a discussion on the underbridge path and whether it would be wiser to build it only the pedestrian and bike path due to the, to, due to the additional cost with no funding from the federal government and complications of dividing that path. We had an update from the staff on inquiries, inquiries we had of areas of concern. Staff provided an update on public transit. Staff asked uh, for representation at the Charette on March 11th and Lutz and several CAC members are committed to attend. Our next CAC meeting will be held on March 4th in Land Lakes. And uh, just as an aside, as a resident of Land Lakes, we are having some um, 41 um, resurfacing and widening. And um, the last few days they've been doing it during the day and, and cutting us off into one lane. So it's been backed up way back for miles <laughs> and it's caused quite the traffic problem. And I just wanted to know if the FDOT can do some of that work at night. It would alleviate some of that. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Dr. Stovall, BPAC. Good morning. Um, we had a very interesting meeting. Our last meeting was at Tri-County. It was held down in Tampa. And it's always interesting to hear some of the things that the big counties are doing because they, they have a little bit uh, more going on. We don't want all the stuff going on they have, but I will tell you, safety improvements uh, have been high on the list for Hillsborough County, and they reported the 35% decrease from their last reporting period in accidents revolving bike pads. So, that's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> they have an aggressive plan of more safety uh, things to install, but it's kind of hanging on this uh, new sales tax that's it's a transportation sales tax that's lawsuits have held up so they don't have the revenue. If they get it funded, they have a great plan. Hills, uh, Pinellas is working on finishing the Pinellas Trail. The Pinellas Trail, of course, is, is a model for a lot of areas, and, and what they're trying to do there is make that trail go as a loop all the way around the county, and they have a couple of gaps, and they're now addressing the gaps. Uh, the, the one they're working on uh, now is the North Gap, closest to us, <clears throat> and that would be kind of on the east, uh, sorry, yeah, the east side of the county. Um, and you'd be, proud of, you'd be proud of Pasco County. We have, uh, I've reported before, we have this online bike, uh, bicycle trail map that's been worked on. So we had a great presentation from really our two BPAC committee members, uh, Corey Denninger and Mark Pinson, because both of them have expertise in this area. And um, pascobike.com is a great website that they have. And then the county is really close to uh, unveiling the one the county has worked on. And so they're all working together. It made us look really good. Um, and then the other thing was here in Dade City, uh, the city has just completed the last mile or the second mile, I guess, of the Hardy Trail, which is just a little bit uh, to the west of us here. So Mark Pinson had ridden that and he had a bunch of pictures. So we're able to show pictures of improvements going on and in our county, it made us look good. And uh, on a related theme, I'll just report and the mayor can say more about it if she wishes. You know, um, <clears throat> there is a plan to build a bike building on the Hardy Trail just right over here. And uh, I think the city's having public input here in a couple of weeks. It's all very exciting things for us. So I think we're in a good place, so. 
Thank you very much. Thank Dr. you. Stovall. Any questions? Yeah, I'm just a comment to add on to that. Dr. Stovall is yes Pleasure. on Monday, um, the 17th, right. the 17th and the 24th. We're having a charrettes, and yep. so we are looking for input from the community uh, for that property that the city purchased, which includes the bike hub next to the trails. So we're looking for some input, and I know that we're getting that word out now. So we're looking forward to public input, and thank it's going to be great. But thank yeah. you for that. And you made me. I remembered the other, on the other side of the county. The exciting thing is the, is the Starkey Gap piece of trail that finishes that connection from Pinellas to Pasco. That's been finished, but we're waiting on the official uh, grand opening. And uh, my understanding is that uh, Commissioner Starkey has been talking to the governor's office, and we may we may get the governor to come and perhaps be part of our grand celebration. So, thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Okay, we're going to move forward to action items. Um, first action item is approval of system performance report and safety targets for 2020. Ari Rivera. Good morning, MPO board. Uh, I'm very happy to talk to you today about safety performance measures. And uh, as we all know, safety should be a top priority when considering improvements for our transportation system. However, car accidents have become a major public health concern worldwide, resulting in approximately 1.35 million deaths per year. And 1.35 million deaths per year is a little under twice the population of Pasco County. In the United States, Congress establishes goals for the National Federal Aid Highway Program, and even though safety is the first national goal listed, around 100 people die every day in America from motor vehicle crashes. Automobile accidents are the leading cause of death in the first three decades of Americans' lives, and these statistics come from the Center for Disease Control. Pedestrians are 1.5 times more likely than passenger vehicle occupants to be killed in a car crash on each trip. And the U.S. traffic fatality rate is about 50% higher than other similar industrialized nation, nations. And uh, the good news about that last statistic is that it demonstrates that continued implementation of proven strategies can save thousands of lives and millions of dollars. But to monitor the success of a strategy, we need a data-driven approach, and that's where these performance measures come in. The five national safety performance measures are, let's see if this works for me. Oops, oops, oops. all right, let's see. Number of fatalities. Rate of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. Number of serious injuries. Rate of serious injuries per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. And number of pedestrian and bicycle facilities and serious injuries combined. These performance measures are indicators for our decision makers and stakeholders to monitor changes in the transportation system's performance and to also measure our progress towards meeting goals, objectives, and visions. And they apply to all roads, irregardless of ownership or classification. They are reported um, using a five-year rolling average to better indicate a trend, data trends. So these, uh, these last, let's see, maybe, maybe as Manny said, pointing to the computer. Oh, okay. So these last three columns here are for uh, Pasco County, and the first three columns indicate the data for Florida. The data in green is the official data provided by FDOT for the rolling period between 2014 and 2018. So for the first performance measures, uh, no, number of fatalities, we had 87 for this last period compared to 78 from the previous baseline year or period. That means that we had an 11.5% increase. 
For the rate of fatalities, we had 1.86 for this most recent period, and the previous period had a 1.74, and that means we had a 7% increase in that performance measure. There could be a number of reasons for this uh, increases. However, as our FDOT liaison had indicated to, to us, um, one could be that uh, recently we've experienced a larger number of uh, distracted driving and texting while driving incidents re related to that. For the third performance measure, uh, which is number of serious injuries, we had 1,127 for this last period compared to 1,146 from the previous baseline period. And that means we had a 1.6% decrease in that performance measure, which is good news. For a rate of serious injuries, we had 24.45 for this period, and the previous period was 25.78, which means that we had a 5.2% decrease and the last performance measure shows that for this period, we had 120 compared to 121.6, which means we had a 1.3% decrease. Some reasons for this decrease could be that we're building more bicycle and pedestrian accommodations and that we focused on safety projects such as lighting. Um, also, we did have from our technical advisory committee concerns about uh, reporting the pedestrian and bicycle fatalities and serious injuries combined. However, MPOs report their uh, data uh, in sor sort of a standard format, and uh, this is a, a format that is uh, requested to us from FHWA, so we will provide the segregated data to the committee, but for reporting purposes, we follow the, the template. Um, MPOs also have to set targets, and um, our goal is zero deaths and zero injuries, however, the guidance is that we have to have interim performance level targets, which are just indicators so that they can help move us towards our final goal of zero. Uh, so for 2020, we have set our targets to be the, the last official data provided by FDOT in hopes of not having any more increases and stabilizing this data and then to hopefully see a trend that goes uh, in a in decreasing fashion. D this is our trend line for fatality rate and I didn't, um, I didn't do it for all the performance measure. I didn't put them all here. I just did three just to illustrate um, what the trend line is showing. And we see there how the line is uh, showing that increase, even though we did have a decrease in fatality rate in 2015. And uh, this is here, the years are just ending years for the five year rolling periods. For serious injury rate, we do see how the data was increasing and then that last period had the decrease, but the line is still increasing because we're taking into account data from, from a longer period of time. For pedestrian and bicycle facilities and serious, I mean fatalities and serious injuries, we had a decrease there in 2015 and a decrease in the last five year rolling period, but yet the trend is still moving upwards. and. Um, we, we are hoping that with projects, additional projects like our Vision Zero, like additional safety improvements, we are going to change this trend line. So in summary, we have go gone over our safety performance measures. We have made improvements in three out of the five uh, safety performance measures. We have set our 2020 targets 
and we understand that our safety performance measures and targets are key indicators that help us to, a, a re, to achieve a reduction in fatalities and injuries. Um, are there any questions for staff? Commissioner Mariano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I look at like 2014 to 15, you see it drops, and then from 17 to 18 it drops, but in between that it's gone up steadily. What do you attribute that to? Um, as I said before, I mean, there's, there's a number of things involved in these numbers. Um, you have factors like, let's say, code enforcement issues, these are design, uh, our design standards, things like lighting. So, I mean, it's hard to pinpoint to just one thing. Um, I, as I said before, when we've talked to our liaison in the past, we were perhaps, you know, uh, thinking that one of the big factors in recent trends are what well, we're talking about, the texting and driving and distracted driving. I don't have one specific reason that I could point to that entails like more in-depth studies such as, say, our Vision Zero and other for... I think you just hit on it. Thank you. Thank you. And, any other questions for staff? Um, yeah, yes, uh, thank you. Um, do we have a map of the county with, with the fatalities on it? I mean, that would indicate, is there an area that's a higher rate than others? What a great idea that would yeah, be. Yeah, that is a good idea. I, I believe that we um, did work on that for our LRTP, and traffic operations also has data of that nature, and we can provide that as a follow-up to this. But, and because I think it would just indicate if there's an area that there's yearly fatalities in, that it would indicate So our that. traffic operations uh, produces a report annually uh, I'm not sure for sure if they have a map, but they have uh, from the highest intersections or places where the most of the uh, fatalities take place, they have it in the table, the report. Yeah, I we'll, think that might we'll be helpful. Sure, even, we'll if, even if they don't have the map, I'm sure county staff could, we can do could that, produce yes. a, a heat map of the entire right, county right, showing. Right. Exactly. We can do that. Picture's worth a thousand words. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We, we request that you approve our performance measures and targets. Thank you very Thank much. You. Do we have a motion to approve? Approval. Second. second. We we'll have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Like sign? Motion passes. Next we have action item B, Chairs, Coordinating Committee, Interlocal Agreement. Tania? Gorman's going to present this one. Good morning, board. Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to discuss the CC interlocal agreement that has changed. Um, the CCC, the Chair's Coordinating Committee, is a regional transportation board. It's comprised of elected officials representing six MPOs serving eight counties. Hernando, Citrus, Hillsborough, Pasco, Pinellas, Polk, Sarasota, Manatee. This group collaborates on transportation planning issues across the region, such as um, the trip uh, the trip regional list and the Sun Trail. Since the T Barter's roles have changed from transit, from transportation to a transit agency, the MPOs had to assume some of those roles. Therefore, the interlocal court, the interlocal agreement has changed. And we now have assumed the main responsibility that TMA is a subcommittee of the CCC with specific responsibilities for the three MPOs of Hillsborough, Pinellas, and Pasco. Um, currently, we're asking you guys to review and approve the interlocal agreement for the regional transportation coordination. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Entertain a motion then. Move approval. Second. Move a first and a second. All those in favor, indicate the same aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Thank you. Next, we're going to move on to the Cody River Study Contract it's Time Extension with ACOM and ratify the study task order executed by the BCC. Right. So uh, after the last few MPO meetings, the DOT asked for more time to review and provide input to this study. And um, 
uh, AECOM is asking for us to extend the contract to June 30th to accommodate for that. And also, uh, since the original scope was signed by the Board of County Commissioners, it also needs to be ratified by the NPOs for us to give an extension to AECOM. I'll start off with this one. This news to me is disappointing, to say the least. Um, your, our conversation this morning, you're saying it's being delayed due to DOT, yet our city manager was given a, another excuse yesterday at a, on a conference call. I'll read a statement from our city manager that was texted to me today. As you know, um, the city of New Perky asked for an allocation from the state for $1.8 million to get this project moving because we thought the feasibility study would be done in time to get right. that approved. That's not the case. So this is a statement from our city manager, Debbie Manns. In a conversation yesterday involving Sean Foster, Ralph, Ralph Lair. Sean Foster, by the way, is our lobbyist um, that we hire through the city. Ralph Lair and Mary Helen Duke, it was determined that it would be in the best interest of the project to withdraw the current application for funding related to the Cody River underpass project. The decision was based on the fact that a veto by the governor would render a project ineligible for a state grant for another one year period of time, additionally due to the status of the planning of the project. The planning status has been over, over two years. And I do have to um, get something off my chest. Our city manager, Debbie Manns, is a true professional. She's an asset to the city and the county. She treats others with nothing but the utmost respect when she interacts with them. And I ask that any county staff member that interacts with our city manager affords her the same respect. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any comments? Uh, I find this very disturbing, disappointing. Um, you know, we were pushing to get this feasibility study done so that we wouldn't get caught into this window that we got in last year. Right. Uh, is AUCOM here? Yes, they are here. Some of their staff here, but they're for another project. But I guess Casey can speak to that. I mean, this is, this is a vitally important project that, you know, we just look at all one. the safety data for, for getting people off the streets and, That's you know, true. what underpass, what, what is uh, going on? Good morning, on? this is Casey Kersey with AECOM. I am not the project manager of the contract, but we do invoice through the MPO. And uh, working with Mary Helen and then our AECOM staff, they're trying to quickly finish the report for you. So even though they're talking about extending it through June to invoice it, I believe they're quite close to finishing the report after the coordination that took place in November and December. And I can get back with you on that status immediately. But I don't believe it's because they need to get through June to get the work done for you. It's wrapping up the, the different alternatives that were discussed in December. So I can get back to you on how quickly we can get that report to you. Do they have a feasibility study report date of when they'll have it done when we can actually give it to the state? Because that's what's got the key's gonna be with the governor. And I, I understand they are doing the documentation right now because the alternatives were confirmed and uh, what, what one gets chosen, I don't know that answer. But I will take that back, your concerns today, and get an answer for you today. Uh, I was gonna ask, I thought we were just gonna get to a technical question, not expecting this. Uh, let me ask this question. The city of Port Ritchie owns the land between Catches and the old marina. That piece of land was something that Catches wanted to get, as I brought up six months ago. And the right-of-way that goes along US-19 between Catches and there is where that trail is going to go. Um, Catches was willing to sit down and talk with the city, with the MPO staff. Did that conversation ever happen? Uh, I believe it did, but I don't want so to. Let me say. Yeah, I don't, without so, Paul Kurtz here. Commissioner, if you, uh, later on in the agenda, Mary Duke will present an update on that. And she, she's going to hit on some of the stuff on there. You want to wait till then? Okay. Let's have the conversation now. I'd be more than happy to. Uh, Mary Helen Duke, uh, Long Range Planning. Uh, the um, we're wait, we're still waiting. We have presented. FDOT had requested a number of revisions to the concept alignment, and uh, we have sent that. AECOM has made some changes to the concept alignment based on those comments. We have sent that back to FDOT for their final blessing. We wanted FDOT to be fully on board before we went back to the property owners because we didn't want to have something in limbo that FDOT had not already approved before we went to the property owners. So we will be scheduling those meetings, but only after we have an alignment that FDOT is, is okay with. 
because, of course, we're utilizing some of their right away as well. Is that the information that was portrayed to Ms. Mann yesterday as to the reason for the delay? Um, the reasons for the delay um, are multifold. Uh, one was that um, FDOT, uh, at the last MPO meeting in October, they had requested uh, meetings with staff. We met with staff, with FDOT, twice. Uh, once in late October and once in December. Um, FDOT had requested additional time for their, uh, their attorneys to take a look into the matter of whether or not that special exception uh, formal request was going to be required or not. Uh, that took about four to six weeks from, for FDOT to get back to us and request another meeting and then we had to schedule that meeting. Um, and so we had a meeting on October 18th in 2019 where right-of-way needs were discussed, the U.S. Code and FDOT use policies for motorized vehicles, golf carts, and the county at that meeting requested if that formal exception request would be required, and FDOT requested the time for FDOT attorneys. At the December 5th meeting, FDOT requested a physical trail separator between the bike ped trail and the golf cart path so that they could be physically separated. By providing that physical separation, uh, we believe that FDOT felt, well, perhaps they might could still fund the bike ped part uh, through state or federal funds, but then the golf cart path portion might could be funded uh, through local sources, such as Penny for P Pinellas or whatever other local funding sources the local governments might come up with. Um, Obviously, there's still s several things that need to be determined. Um, who is going to be maintaining and operating the trail upon completion? Um, FDOT raised concerns over how the golf cart path was going to tie into River Golf Road. They had concerns about uh, the original scenario presented by uh, AECOM had part of the golf cart path going right up against US-19. FDOT uh, was very opposed to that. And so uh, AECOM had to go back and redesign uh, and come up with a different scenario for how that golf cart path was going to uh, tie into River Golf Road and not, and not be immediately parallel to US-19. Mm -hmm. And so that is part of the status report that I will be providing later on. Mr. Um, so yeah. FDOT has determined that at that, based on the information they had at that point in time, uh, that they felt no formal exception letter was going to be required, uh, but that depends on the funding sources. Right. And once again, I, I, I'll leave it at this. That's not the reason for the delay that was portrayed to our city manager yesterday in a conference call from what I was told. And the reason it's so disappointing for us as a city is there's a lot of projects we could ask for funding for from our state legislators. We chose this one because it's that important to the city of New Newport and Port Richie and West Pasco County as a whole. Now, because of the delay, we have no choice but withdraw that request. Commissioner Mariano. I, I would say, look, before we vote on this, I'd, I'd like to hear that full presentation and then we can go back to this item, I think, after that. I, I think the information we may get might be better for direction. Um, what are our options? Do we have the choice but to vote on this today? I mean, no, today. We can, no, we can vote it today. I just want to hear the presentation. Okay, okay perfect. Board okay with that? Delaying the vote until yeah, the, the full presentation, and we'll, then we'll come back to the item. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to Pasco County Public Transportation Reports and Updates. The Vision Zero update of ACOM Casey Kersey. Did I skip one? I think, I think Casey, you're up. No, no. I think Kurt's up. No. Kurt's up? What did I skip? Oh, I apologize. Kurt, come on up. Pasco County Public Transportation Report. Then we'll move on to the other. Kurt Scheibel, PCB Director. Um, good morning, all. Um, don't have a lot to, for you today. Uh, we're right in the middle of budget season, so just kind of give you some of the projects we're looking at for the next year. Uh, we're really going to be focusing on our. Um, just a second. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, focusing on our uh, bus stop amenities. So uh, you'll start seeing uh, presentations about different types of bus shelters that we would like to look at and various other um, things moving forward, where to put the bus shelters and so forth like that. If you have a location you'd like us to look at, please let us know so we can start looking at the ridership numbers and making sure we meet all our Title VI uh, requirements. 
on those so we can get those out there. Also, we're looking at access to our bus shelters for our different ADA type of requirements and putting some things out there. So we're going to start getting the contracts and pouring some concrete and get some more shelters out there. And this is going to start turning into, instead of just, you know, pulsing every so often, there's going to be a, um, almost a yearly type of process is what we're trying to develop. So as time goes on, we are always improving our bus stop amenities for our uh, folks and both with uh, bus stops, um, shelters, and bus benches too. The other things we're working on is um, the, uh, we're about to start Shady Hills. Uh, the buses are supposed to start construction at the end of March, uh, which means delivery about the middle of April. Uh, if everything goes well, we hope to have that up and running on sometime after July, probably be after the uh, 4th of July holiday, so we can do it like on a Monday and things like that. And then the other thing is, is that they we're, we're literally at the last gasps of uh, the McKendry getting it all completed and so forth. And so you'll probably all get invitations to come out for our ribbon cutting for the McKendry facility right down here. It's, uh, if you haven't driven by, it's a really nice facility. Lots of uh, good uh, location uh, for us. Um, and uh, the team is really excited to get in there, just wait for the furniture delivered to get the last, and the last little, as you will know, there's always one thing that needs to be fixed before we can get in there. Uh, other than that, I don't have uh, oh, I do have one more thing is, is that uh, you always talk about the Tabarda and so forth. And you used to have voted on a thing for Tabarda. One of the things that, uh, just to make sure that you're aware of, there's a funding uh, aspect to that too. They are going to start, uh, they're applying for, for the 5307 funding that we get through um, FTA for the Tampa Bay St. Pete UZA. So they will be getting a bigger piece of that uh, funding as time goes on, which is going to be absorbed by all three counties. And I will also be, our county here will also be seeing reduced numbers on that. Just so you understand that that is one of the things that not really talked about, but there will be a reduction in how much money I get, when, how much and when all that is, all depends on all the formulas and how that goes into the whole process. But we'll see what happens on that. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions? Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry to mess up the order there. Ms. Kersey, you're up now with the Vision Zero update. May come. Good morning. It's Casey Kersey, and it's a pleasure always to uh, serve this board in the Pasco in Pasco County. And I have with me Tanning Bickford. Um, so we are just kicking off Vision Zero for Pasco County as well through the MPO, and all the presentations today are very timely as we look at what are some of our issues for safety. Um, Channing is going to go through the presentation because I want you to get to know him. He's going to be helping me with the Vision Zero uh, work. And um, it's really about education right now. But I did want to let you know I want to make myself available for any of the commissioners and board members who would like to meet one on one and talk a little bit about Vision Zero and what your concept is for the county and what you're looking for as we kick it off. I'll work through Manny and Tania to set those meetings up and I'd be happy to be available at any time to do that. Thank you, Casey. I'm uh, Channing Bickford with AECOM. Um, I'm going to start with just a short explanation of what Vision Zero is. I'm sure you might have heard of it or you're familiar with Vision Zero. It originated in Sweden in the late 1990s, and many other European cities, American cities, cities around the world have adopted uh, Vision Zero ordinance or these type of programs. This is a strategy to eliminate all serious injuries and fatalities on the roadway, and it's for all roadway users, not just pedestrians and bicyclists, but also motorists, passengers, transit users, anybody who's using the roadway. And it really starts with two questions. Um, how is human behavior conflicting with design? And then how can you adjust or change that behavior? And it does work. There have been um, a number of places that have had reductions in serious injury accidents or fatalities. Most notably, Oslo in Norway last year reached one fatality for the entire year. Um, Sweden, where this originated over the last five years, has seen a 50% reduction in pedestrian and cyclist um, fatalities. Um, in Florida, um, Hillsborough County to the south of us has had a fairly notable Vision Zero program. Um, and uh, a lot of education and public engagement activities. Fort Lauderdale has also been um, a leader with MPO partnership. They've had um, a lot of education um, for 
the different groups, cyclists, drivers, but also for school children. Um, Ford Pinellas has just kicked off a Vision Zero program as well. Um, and then there's some other entities in the area that have Vision Zero-like programs, but not a unified not a unified Vision Zero policy or program itself. So the Polk TPO has had some activities that fit into Vi Vision Zero, Sarasota Manatee MPO, Metro Plan Orlando. Um, and then Pasco MPO is kind of one of the first smaller MPOs to start a Vision Zero program. You can see this map right here, a little bit hard to see on the screen with the uh, green and blue, but that, those are a lot of the cities that have adopted or counties, MPOs that have adopted a Vision Zero program. The main focus of Vision Zero is combating these serious injury crashes and fatality crashes through these five E's. Um, includes education, um, talking to people about how to use the roadways in an appropriate manner, a safer manner, whether they be cyclists, pedestrians, drivers, transit users. Through engagement, um, Hillsborough MPO has done a lot of this. They did the pike, paint the bike lane, paint the intersection, things to draw attention to uh, um, pedestrians and cyclists in kind of a high, a crash area or a high pedestrian activity area. Enforcement, working with our local law enforcement agencies to um, raise awareness of kind of violating certain rules that impact safety, speeding, um, using crosswalks improperly, biking improperly. Um, the next one, engineering, and this is generally where people's minds go first with Vision Zero, is how do we engineer our roadways to be safer? A lot of that has been done in Pasco County. There's already been a lot of activities and efforts to create safer roadways, but this is also, in this Vision Zero plan, going to be a little bit more about policy. How do we implement um, safer design by policy so that new projects moving forward will automatically include these? And then finally, evaluation, and Ari made a great presentation earlier showing some of the statistics that we have already for Pasco County, showing how the trends are going up for fatalities um, and kind of a little bit mixed for pedestrian and bicycle injuries and fatalities. So we want to make sure that this plan is not just a one-size-fits-all thing, something that's appropriate for Pasco County. First, we have a lot of the data already available. The LRTP contains a lot of the injury um, and fatality information. Uh, you asked earlier about heat maps for the county showing where these accidents are. That data is already available, and we'll be able to kind of use that to target um, changes to specific areas or education for specific areas. Um, so in February, we um, are here at the MPO board. We have talked to the CAC and the TAC um, about the plan and gotten some recommendations from them. And then we'll be moving on for, to engaging other stakeholders. Um, and then in May and June, we're looking to start implementing more of an education portion of the plan, um, including uh, having an educational video we might be able to show different places. Uh, we had some great recommendations from the TAC about neighborhood engagement, um, going to HOAs and talking to people there. Also, uh, there was a um, collision involving a cyclist and a pedestrian on the Suncoast Trail recently. They said perhaps we want to take a look at doing some education around cycling safely on the trail um, and, and respecting pedestrians in that manner. Um, but if there are any other uh, questions or, or recommendations, we'd be happy to take those into consideration. One, Mr. Roper. Just a little more details. I think in the past, so did Representative Toledo um, help out a little bit with your getting things rolling with uh, Vision Zero? Vision Zero, yeah. We really haven't got rolling with Vision Zero. I think that's yeah. where a lot of people get missed. We've had a lot of actions that the MPO and the county have taken to improve safety. Um, we've got a lot of projects that were just approved in your tent. We've got a lot of lighting projects along US 19 and some other things that we'll come back with you to show you successes of what the county does without calling it Vision Zero. It's really a part of what you do to try to keep your residents safe. So we haven't officially kicked anything off that's considered Vision Zero yet. Well, I, in Hillsborough County, I thought she was a big, she was a part of it in Hillsborough County at one time. Am um, I not correct? Could be, yes. Oh, okay. How were you funded? How were you funded? So, so for, for us, for Vision Zero, we are funded through the MPO to get a campaign going for you. And that includes creating a video that will do uh, some short uh, public service announcements, possibly, and we need to decide how to do that. And beyond that, we're not funded past June to create the specific tasks. That will be up to the MPO to decide what they want to do as far as going forward with more Vision Zero activities. Have you not done anything in Hillsborough County? So while, while we've been personally involved in some of the activities that they've done, we don't, as a firm, we're not involved with Vision Zero in Hillsborough County. I see. Okay. 
Gotcha. I got that. Get your question. My you apologies. Get, I was that's okay. But uh, um, no, we haven't been involved personally. Other than that, we okay. uh, a lot of our eight home employees work there, and they were out yeah. painting, you know, as part of the, the public engagement. Okay. So gotcha. But the visions, vision zero in general, uh, Hillsboro County has. They yeah, embraced taken, it. Embraced there are a okay. lot of fabulous resources through okay. the federal government and FDOT. Um, there was a recent advertisement during the football games back in December um, that was very hot. Very powerful, yeah. Yes. So, and uh, those kind of resources are made accessible to any kind of uh, situation in our county in the field that wants to do vision zero. So, we'll, we'll be able to piggyback on those resources, and then AECOM can also help us create some very personal ones to PASCO with the board members involved, possibly in the video, whatever you're thinking for me. The main thing is, it's not about roadway design. Everyone goes right to that, or bike pet. We tend to think bike pet because they're the vulnerable users, right? So we perk up when we hear that they've been injured. It's all users of the system. So based on your trends and conditions report that your traffic operations group creates, the stuff <coughs> from LRTV will start trying to hone in on some areas and maybe pick the top five across the county that we can education about and we'll be coming back to you for that. You're gonna you're gonna see us a lot between now and June. Cool, more question? Yes, look. Um, so we have some areas in like central Pasco that are, that are um, neighborhoods that are very well established. Um, traffic is increasing on those roads. Lots of people are using um, some of the I like to call the just the neighborhood roads as connectors, especially in that central Pasco area between areas like Collier Boulevard and, and, and 41 and stuff around Lake Pageant and such. And, and uh, we don't have sidewalks there, you know, and um, obviously I'd be very supportive of, of, of having sidewalks there, but I know it's a, an issue. But so when it comes to education for like those types of folks, because um, they, they don't have that, you know, the kids are walking on the streets and, and as, the, as, as we grow and more development happens in those areas and <clears throat> I know there's some, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, some things coming into us in the future which would um, bring additional um, density to those areas. Which and that, be, and you're, you're right on target, yeah. so that's what this whole process will be, it'll be a longer process, we're just kicking it off now, is identifying through each of your districts also some of the areas that we're seeing uh, can be for the school children, you know, at, um, uh, Deborah Bullock said, I don't like that they ride at night. You know, we'd like some of it to be about getting funding for lights for kids that ride at night. We get to put it all in a basket and look at all the issues across the county. And part of Vision Zero that does exactly what you're asking is it brings money to the county by identifying safety issues. Mm -hmm. So you do connect it to funding that can be city, county, state, federal funding, start getting some extra yeah. Education is one component of it. Um, just like we're doing right now with the red light, we're talking about a lot of these flashing beacons and the legislature should be red and we actually have to stop now instead of yellow. The ability to use our system properly and overcome when we're not paying attention and we're failing the system and we're getting hurt has a lot to do with the education part of it as well. Um, we've interviewed um, the TAC, for instance, and we had some great input on People in Casco don't know how to use these flashing beacons, for instance. And so VINCAP is going to give us a map of where all the flashing beacons are for the county as well as the cities. And let's talk about if there's accidents happening there. Maybe sidewalks, and just start a full program of what we're seeing sidewalk issues throughout the county. So a lot of things can come out of Vision Zero uh, and we target specific needs and areas. Can I continue for a second? Of course. Thank you. Um, so I'll begin talking about some of our old developments, you know, new developments required, you know, sidewalks, trails, things like that again, but you know, it's a high concern in, in that area for me and, and a lot of my, a lot of my constituents, um, our constituents, I should say, actually. Um, so if you're going to get together with us individually, you stated? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So if I were to, it's just for example, <laughs> if, if, um, I were to get some obviously, um, stats, numbers you know ready for you or my me and my team could on some of those areas that I'm talking about where that okay where that density is and again if you I mean if you you know in your in your travels we can suggest different areas for you or your team members whoever to, to check out to, to, to you know go out and traverse that area oh, we would love that kind okay of good really. absolutely because we were good. using we were using a lot of the metro plus data initially because people were able to tell us their issues without a certain project in mind so we were starting with the metro plus input as well and we have a 4,000 
comments. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but absolutely, anything okay. that you can give me that's an issue in your district where you have concerns, yeah. then okay. we'll kind of create. A okay. Good. Because I won't. I won't talk about it further today. But um, mm -hmm. just one last question. Then, so there would be the there's a possibility that you'd be able to assist in a way to po possibly seek state or federal funding for sidewalks in that area. Too. We could. We could. Yes. Okay. We, we want to target that. Good. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much. And, and Andy, we'll get with you in a second. To, we'll set that appointment up before you yes, leave. I know. Andy. <laughs> okay. Mariana. Thank you, guys. Thank thank you. For this A couple more questions, Mr. Mariano. Um, you know, and Commissioner Moore, I think you're bringing up a great idea when you when you talk about roads that we put in after the after the developments were in, with like Hale Road and Bell Lake Road. You know, we knew we didn't have much right away just to even get the road, and never mind that. So, getting the roads in were critical. But there's a way to put the sidewalks in. I think is huge. When I look at areas that are coming up on our MPO list, like Zimmerman and Ranch Road, two areas where never had a sidewalk that are connector roads uh, all the way through that are important to get those done as well. So if this Vision Zero can be combined with that, with overpasses, with extra lighting in certain areas that would need it, and we could then reach out to another pot of money for federal funds, because from what I can see, is almost every major city has like, got something going on with it. Yes. That's what your intention is? projects that are um, on your minds, what kind of funding traditionally funds them, where else can we look for additional funding, uh, what agencies traditionally fund them. The State Department of Transportation has put in quite a bit of safety money recently to Pasco County, working through VINCAT and um, their staff. So we'll, that will be a working document for you to always have, is this is where traditionally these are paid for, this is how, here's some other ideas, and what we can do. It's so Vision Zero, the program itself, doesn't guarantee money, but it sets you up to where you're heading that way to get generally safety funds is what you're looking for. Okay. Um, and so um, we can come back and we can explain a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with that and we need to be for any questions. Great. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good. Good. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. We'll move on to um, Mary Helen Duke. If you can come back up with the Cody River Trail Phase 1 Feasibility Study Update. Um, good morning again. Um, so I've already, let me get back to where I should be. Okay. So we believe the study to be is about 75% complete for the Cody River Trail US 19 underpass. Uh, AECOM received the notice to proceed to start work on this in May of 2019, so they've been working on it less than nine months. Um, on January 21st, we received a letter from AECOM requesting the six-month time extension. Um, alternate scenario B was the alternate that uh, was last presented to this board um, as the preferred al alternate. That was an 18-foot um, Rail on, uh, on on both public and private right away, and so since then we've had two meetings with F. Dot. At the first meeting, we actually met with David Gwynn, the District Seven Secretary, and um, he expressed uh, significant concern at that meeting regarding uh, the funding for the trail and concerns related to the, the motorized vehicles, golf carts, um, and um, that we needed to make certain that we were, you know, following all the FDOT and U.S. Code rules related to that. Um, and so he requested some time for his uh, FDOT attorneys to have a chance to look at the proposed alignment and also look at the formal exception rules to determine whether or not uh, they would be requiring um, the, the interlocal agreement group, which consists of Pasco County, City of Newport Ritchie, and Port Ritchie, you know, whether or not that group would need to file for that formal exception request. And so they finally called us back for a meeting on de December 5th of 2019, and um, they requested that that physical barrier separator be provided between the bike trail and the golf cart path. Um, my understanding is that could be take the form of a raised curb about four inches in height. Uh, they indicated uh, they wanted to make certain that their um, 
maintenance vehicles could get underneath. They, they preferred for the barrier to be removable. Um, now, if, if the communities wanted at some later date to install a more artistic type back barrier, as long as that artistic barrier um, was removable, they would be okay with that as well. Can I, can I stop real quick? I'm sorry, I know it's been discussed for what, two years now? Yes. Okay, two years now. I mean, I'm, this is just more of a statement. I don't, I don't, um, I don't no, I'm not done. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, I guess, I don't know, I guess I'm kind of in awe that it's, it's this difficult to figure out how to allow people to utilize golf carts and allow people to walk. It's not, I, we do it where I live, <laughs> you know, and uh, I see it in multiple areas. I mean, heck, look, go down to Sun City Center, they figured it out pretty good. I, I, I just, I'm, I know, I, I don't know. You know, I just, I mean, we're, we're working on something that, in my mind, is just a simple, simple project. And we're going round and round. We're having meeting after meeting after meeting about it. I, I just don't understand why we can't figure out how to allow somebody to golf cart, allow somebody to walk or on the bike. I took, I, that's just me. I took, my, to piggyback on that, I took my, I agree 100%. I took my boat out yesterday. We had a presentation for a work session at Newport Chief City Council Chambers on Tuesday. Um, we're hiring a marketing strategist um, who's from Greenville, the gentleman that did the presentation to help market the city of Newport Ritchie. Um, I offered to take him for, because he'd never been to Newport Ritchie, got in at 1 o'clock p.m. that afternoon and presented to us that evening. And one of the questions he asked us is, look, why do you love living here? And my response to him was, you know, I grew up here. I love this city. I love this town. I love everything that West Pasco has to offer, especially the water. I'm like, if you drive down US 19, 90% of the people have no idea the Gulf of Mexico is half a mile to mm -hmm. the west. No idea. Sure. So I offered to take him on a boat tour. So I took the day off of work yesterday and took him out and showed him the still houses. Never been out in the Gulf before, at least in this area. Brought him up the river, showed him all the waterfront, you know, the potential there with Port Ritchie, and then all the way up to Sims Park and down towards the Great Preserve by boat. And he was just blown away. And as we were passing, the going under the bridge, I was explaining the underpass we're trying to get built there and the purpose behind it and he noticed all the golf carts you know over 200 almost 300 golf carts registered in the city of Newport last year and you know his first response was what a great idea that should be easy and I said yeah you would think so well and I, I tell you part of one of my real concern about this whole thing is we knew last year we had this problem getting the feasibility study done we knew DOT didn't really want us to go this way at the same time we knew we had to keep pushing the button so when I see 45 days from one meeting to the next meeting, when we get deadlines come up, if we don't get this done, we could get vetoed again for the very reason we got vetoed last time. And it's been nine months into it. And I see we're at 75%. And I don't see our project manager here today to talk about this, to, to at least tell us how close we can really be. And we're going to look at those numbers. I mean, how quick can we make this 75%, 100%? That's my, that's my number one thought right now. Um, but go ahead with the presentation. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Commissioner Mariano. Um, um, we believe that it's just a matter of, you know, four to six weeks and we might be able to complete this. One of the things that I wanted to point out to you that was that because of the changes that FDOT uh, requested of us regarding the alignment, we've had to widen the path by another two feet. That means that AECOM is going to have to go back and update the cost estimates. Originally, they were at about 3.6 million, with the um, the golf cart path being about $700,000 of that. Um, so we do anticipate that the estimated cost is going to increase. I think it's going to be somewhere between, hopefully, below 4 million. But I don't really know at this point what the total cost is. That's one reason we can't move forward is we don't have more up-to-date cost estimates. We want to make certain that when AECOM does these final cost estimate runs, that we're working with a plan that FDOT has approved. So I'm sorry it does take time to, um, for those reviews to take place. Um, and, um, you know, well, let me just stop you for a second. We've been trying to expedi hey, expedite up. this me, to the extent that we second? can. Can I stop for a second, Mariana? All right, but I want you to just consider this. Cost estimates a lot of, will depend on what it costs to buy the right way, correct? Yeah. 
have we isolated what parts of property you need from catches yet? Yes, the red areas shown on this plan have been determined since uh, last October. Have you shown that to catch us to what we need? Um, not yet, because we wanted to make certain uh, that we uh, had... Let me just stop you. Catch us, as, as we had said in a the, in the public meeting, they had been at, had been at the first kickoff meeting we had of this, they're willing to work with us. In the interim of this whole thing, they bought the marina beside it. The property beside them in the Bridge Street is now even more valuable to them. To get whatever we would need, they were willing to cooperate with us as we walked the streets, though we couldn't quite discuss it, you and I, because they were still in the transaction mode. The transaction mode happened. If you're going to use cost estimates and you can do a swap with property owned by the city of Port Ritchie to what they have, that's a big number to, to, that could come way down in what your cost feasibility is. At the same time, it could, it could have been sped up at the same time we're doing all these other things. It, I don't know why we wouldn't have approached them once we had the layout to go to that. And with all due respect, uh, Commissioner Mariano, we have not had the final layout because FDOT requested changes in terms of how how the project ties into River Gulf, River Trace Road. So we had to go back and change that. Those changes took place between December 20th and, um, and, and the end of January. So um, we've had both FDOT has taken a harder look at the concept plan. We've also requested our traffic operations manager and our our bike ped coordinator to um, take a hard look at it um, and we came up with a list of a multitude of questions that we just as county staff had regarding the project we asked AECOM to take a look at those AECOM has gone through and looked at those issues as well trying to address what they can and what's appropriate during the the concept trail alignment phase of this project so um, Can I ask one more question? I'm sorry. Commissioner Murphy. Let's. <laughs> if you were to just build this, I'll call it a bridge, walkway. I'm going to call it a bridge. It's a bridge. It goes over water, right? We'll call it a bridge. A bridge, <laughs> bridge. A bridge or a bridge, right? <laughs> if you were to, the original plan, how, how wide was that originally? Before it was we got 18 feet originally was was the original proposal that, that, that this group approved and that the joint okay. city county uh, workshop okay. So approved. the width originally was 18 feet wide? Right. Okay. And that cost, before all these changes have been made, um, how much was that? 3.6 million. 3.6 million to build, that's a very skinny piece of water down there. I boat around there too. Um, there you go. Three point, Six million dollars at, at a width of 18 feet to go across. Okay, just throwing this out. Here. Okay, don't know if this is possible. I, this is your, you know, I say it's your gig. It's everybody's it's gig, county. but it's, it's our your, county. You know what I mean? It's our <laughs> county. Um, if this were to be a private bridge, not in F dot or county right away, private property to private property. What, what would be the rules that would have to be followed to put that That bridge? cannot happen because FDOT, well, the state owns the land underneath the water. So that's one issue you have to deal with. The other issue oh, is that FDOT has control water. over the, the right of way underneath the bridge uh, or the, the you see where I'm going? Mm -hmm. Okay. Not under the bridge, somewhere else. I'm just um, asking. What I, I, I couldn't tell you how long it would take without knowing what that alignment was. Yeah. Yeah, I really yeah. could not. I know. Could that somebody do that? Could somebody legally? Could somebody legally put a bridge across that water with county permission if it's not within state right away, with county permission? Um, would that be allowed? Well, you would have to determine who owns the submerged lands. Are they? Are those owned by the state? Uh, and so if they're owned by the state, then the state would have to be involved with that approval Probably process. Approval also, the Army Corps of Engineers forward. would have to be involved in permitting. It, it, it's, it would take the same, probably a very similar permit path uh, and uh, design path in terms of still having to get different approvals from various agencies. 
So we're working with trying to get three local governments plus uh, two major property owners plus um, um, F dot all on the same page. And, you know, coordinating that does take time. It does take time. The first year was spent on getting the interlocal agreement together. Then the next five months were spent on getting the, the scope of work with AECOM agreed to and signed off on. AECOM has done a great job working for us uh, on developing the different concepts. So, um, if, if I could link it to a technical question. Of course. All right, so when I, when I look at the map, if you, if you focus on the top part of the gray where it hits River Gulf, if everybody yeah. takes a look at that. I'll take you to that. No, you just. Yeah, there you okay. go. All right, so perfect. All right, so when you get that section, right now the way you're showing it, is that trail going to go right into River Gulf at that point? Uh, River Gulf is designated as a local street in the city of Port Ritchie. All the local streets that are um, that have uh, posted speed limits of less than 30 miles per hour are designated as golf cart friendly streets. There's actually a golf cart friendly sign already on River on this road. All right, all right so let me just stop. <coughs> so it's a, it's a yes. That's yes. what's designed to go. Yes. Out. So when we were out there, we talked with them, and let's face it, with catches, they don't use their whole parking lot. Now they may do some major renovations and changes down the road. But we talked about possibly taking that golf cart path and going right up to the edge of the road. You could put an, at least if you put it like an eight, eight foot wide path, maybe a 12 foot wide path running down that whole side, it probably would be a lot safer crossing over to Bayview than the, the next cross street up than it would be coming that close to 19. And I can see FD, EOT having concerns. That's a conversation that could have been had if we're doing a land swap with them. To right, kind of like say, and we, we wanted- Let's go make it safer and better. And and make that happen. And Ms. Duke, if I may, I agree 100%. I mean, I've also had, I know the owners that catch this part of the family and I, I speak to them on a regular basis. It's not like they're against, it'd be one thing if they were against this project, so you're not using any of our land, do whatever you can with F dot land, but we're not on board with this. They want this to happen. The city of Newport, she wants this to happen. Pasco County wants this to happen. Port, she wants this to happen. So you said it's a lot of bringing a lot of people together. A lot of people together want it to happen. That's a frustration on my part. I'm looking at the smiles on the FDOT folks. So they want us to be able to have golf carts. It's just they have rules you have to go by. But it right. happens in other places all throughout the state of Florida, and I just can't fathom as to why this is so difficult. So. so at this point, this is this is the final design, this is the final concept design that has been forwarded to FDOT one last time for them to have one last blessing on it. And once that is done, then, then AECOM can update the cost estimates. We can um, uh, start having meetings with the property owners if that's the, the desire. Um, we have to finish the feasibility study. AECOM still has to make a determination based on what we know is it feasible. We think it's feasible. Um, but it's feasible depending on whether or not we can acquire that right away from the property owner. So that's definitely the next step in terms of determining the feasibility of the project. So another issue that we had with FDOT was they were concerned about the height clearance of the underpass. They, we had requested an eight foot height clearance in order to try to get as, as long of a life cycle for the bridge structure as possible underneath the overpass um, because of um, the, the projections for sea level rise that are coming out of the, the uh, Tampa Bay um, uh, Re, uh, Resiliency Initiative. And uh, at first FDOT was opposed to the, to the eight foot, but there is a rule that allows under constrained conditions to allow it to go to eight feet. So uh, FDOT has now cleared us in terms of doing the eight feet, which is a good step forward. Thank you for that. Um, so, um, in order to move the in order to move the path away from US 19, there actually is going to have to be a crossing point of the bike ped trail and the golf cart path. So we had to have so we requested AECOM to put in stop bars and stop signs. The bike ped path is going to have first priority. The golf carts are going to have to stop uh, 
and allow the, 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 the pedestrians or bicycles to have, um, have first priority. There are going to be removable bollards installed uh, to prevent the golf carts from accidentally trying to get onto the bike ped path that's going to run along that section of US 19. Mr. Chairman. So, um, eight, um, I don't Mary know. Mary Ellen, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I really think it's something that we need to get a look at that. I wouldn't mind talking, having an FDU to you come up and comment to this. I mean, to have that intersection point right there when people are coming down 19, it's a move down, down the hill, taking a hard right when you get, you know, six lanes of traffic coming in. Anybody getting out is really probably really anxious about trying to make that turn to go up the hill and off to the right um, at that key point. To, to direct people to exit there and cross there is, is to me, it's, it's ludicrous. That thing should be, take everybody in that same path, bring them all the way up and around, bring them all the way up to where it says Bayview Street there, and that's where the crossing point should happen. That's where all the action is anyway. There's nothing on towards 19. Those people direct everybody right inside. They're going to get closer to Whiskey Joe's, Hooters, uh, C C Seaside, Guild Dogs. That's where they're going to go. They're not going out towards 19. But then the, the golf carts would have to cross right there at River Golf. Let them bring, bring them right down there. With people turning in from 19. Right? Well, we, yeah, we don't want them crossing right there. If they're going to cross, let them cross down over here, work their way and meander back out, and maybe on the back end when more things happen inside the city where it's all where they can cr cross on the roads and drive on the roads. They can work their way back out along 19. We don't need them traveling on 19. This would make it just so much safer. Yeah, and and if, and if we can do that land exchange with them, we can probably get that land for nothing, all the land to the side for nothing, and just let them vacate that Bridge Street Road, which is just a path out to you know, a, a, a dead end spot anyway. Yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, when, when we originally met with Catches, they indicated that they did not want the golf cart path to, go, to cross their property. And that, so that's why. Where where did they not want it to cross? When we when we walked the site with them uh, during the site visit, they indicated that they did not want it to cross. They would prefer they would, wanted it to go up to River Golf. They did not want to lose the parking. That Correct. They, had they didn't in that want area. it to go in front of their building. That was true. Mm -hmm. They wanted to go down further. It was going to cross. So where I'm talking about is very applicable. Where it would be probably non-controversial to them and very beneficial. They didn't want to, where people are going to be entering restaurants and into the parking lot. This is not going to be where it's going to be. It's going to be right before all that could happen. And they can <coughs> change the figure. I mean, they got concrete blocks without only using part of their parking lot anyway. They would reconfigure everything if they knew this was going to happen to, to come forward to make it a better plan. I mean, we don't know what they're going to do with the marina they own now to the catches now. Something really big could go up there in redevelopment. But they clearly did not want to go in front of their building where people are going to enter. But up in the front here, I don't think I have a problem with it at all. Ms. Duke, may I ask if F. Dog would like to come up? Do you have any comments or no? Yes, go ahead. Can I make a yes. comment in the interim? Um, um, we have to remember this is a concept alignment. And of course, through the right of way acquisition process, there are going to be tweaks and turns and, and potential changes. And that'll be great if, if, if something better can be evolved out of that. But we had to work based on the information we had at the time and what the property owner had told us when we met with them. So that, that's where that, this concept came from and what FDOT indicated that they wanted. Well, maybe Commissioner Mariano could contact the Thank property you. owner and meet with them. I, I think we need again. to set a meeting up with the city. We need to set a meeting up with the city, with FDOT, um, county staff, AECOM, and, and let's get together and talk about making this happen so, to where they're agreeable to. Thank you, Ms. Duke, for your presentation. Okay, yeah, I'm Richard Moss with Director of Development for FDOT District 7. Um, I've just been on the periphery of this, um, been making sure it's been moving forward. I was aware of the eight foot issue under the, the bridge and we had gotten that resolved and, and we're working with the county and, on, and staff on that. Um, I'm not really sure about the earmark, what the issue is with that. Um, my understanding is it's for design and construction. So we're still in the design and construction phase so we could, I'm not really sure why that's not being moved for, moved forward. I don't see it. 1.8 million for design and construction. Well, Correct. That's my understanding. I'm. I, I guess based on the conference call, for, I was not on the call. From what I was told, was that it was in everyone's best interest to keep this moving forward, to rescind that request for the funding okay. because the feasibility study was not going to be completed. And at that point, if it got approved with no feasibility study, it would get vetoed, and then we'd have to wait another year to ask for another penny. That, that's basically what I was told. His, his Does, that make sense? Does that make sense to you? Or? Yeah. 
Because if not, if not, yeah, I'll contact just, this man. No, soon yeah, just an all sorry DOT District Seven. Um, generally, yes, we need to have uh, you need to have some type of concept plan, feasibility study, PD and E completed uh, when you approach for your earmark. And the only reason why is because they try to avoid uh, funding a project without having the background information. Because if they give you the funding and then you can't spend it, then it comes out of our work I program. Understand. Which is why we have it because we have no feasibility yeah, study. Correct, completed. correct. Seventy five percent. Yeah, and when you talk about the timeline of the feasibility study, I guess uh, you know, uh, for us, we were approached in October, and you know, some of the some of the requests, you know, obviously we can move as fast as we can move, but the feasibility study, you know, from our side, you know, could have moved forward just with the assumptions or with you know with the exceptions. So anyway, we we, we do that quite often, you know, we have a feasibility study and in our conclusions we document that, you know, these are the caveats. The caveats are you need an exception for your height, you need an exception for this, right. you need for, a variation for this. For y'all to prove it, that's just one part of the entire study. Correct, yeah. Because so. things change in design. Absolutely. You know. Mr. Mariano. Mr. Chairman, one of, the, one of the things I think was a benefit of actually going for this uh, earmark funding was we weren't going to be bound by federal rules as far as procurement, as far as land acquisition. So as much as all that is something that could delay this is actually a way to speed it up as well i mean do you guys think we could go to work together on this real fast and get this done like real quick if we got yeah, a yeah, of I, my understanding too is from staff is that our comments are about essentially over i mean we're, we're we've finalized them and we're just running it back through the reviewers to make sure they were addressed and then we're checking the box so that i mean that's where so we're you're not holding this up excuse me you're not holding this up at this point my understanding is no. Uh, we, we've we've done our review. Our attorneys were were pretty good with the with the, the concept and having the golf carts. I, we're moving forward with it. And and Mr. Chairman, if you, if you think that it can still get done in this time frame, please reach out to Miss Mans. You know, mm -hmm. I, you okay. know, I can't reach out to get right. the sunshine. But I if mean, you we want, can if have. You think we, it can reach out to her. And I, I think we ought to give it a shot. Um, I think we're that close. And I th and I think. Did you you see the comments I was making as far as making that connection over there if yeah if that change was made that's not going to affect you guys much no, i mean a we, bit safer. we're still at, i mean when we get into design this is like i said feasibility we still got opportunities to to look at the the, the connections and everything and, and and do what's the safest for, for the um facility okay so maybe we can I mean, sorry no excuse me sorry no no you, I, i'm sorry no. but at this point going back to the most um asking for a motion we don't have we have to extend this correct at this correct point. so Unless there's any other, I'm going to just make a comment motion. with it as we okay. as we make the motion that we we ask FDOT to work with us immediately. I mean, even today, I'll go out and start working on this thing to try to get this thing rolling fast. Especially when you, if you guys are here, you can help us. We go to the other side of the county. We can reach out to Lowe's, the Lowe's family catches and get with them quickly. Work with the city to get us all together and just try to make this thing. Look at the numbers. Look at trying to make this acquisition happen, the trade happen, and just. Get it rolling fast. Has anyone talked to catchers about donating the right of way for the trail? Well, yeah. like, as I said, there's a piece of land on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, we ha we have, and and, and I'm going to tell you what what was the conversation. It, 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 this is a public meeting we brought up before. There's a piece of land that's right between catchers and a new piece of property they bought by a marina. They would like to get that land. That's why I say they would probably give us all that we need, do an exchange for their exactly. even trade, and away we go. That's why I say the cost numbers that we're looking, at, I think, are going to drop way down. If there's right away costs that are in there. Yes, sir. So once again, Commissioner Moran, before you make your motion, if you were going to make a motion, please reach out to Ms. Manz after the meeting. Let I her will. know. I, and I, I did try to call her on the way over, but it. thank you. Okay. All right. Move approval. Thank you, gentlemen. We have a second. motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Like sign. Thank you very much. We move on to T-Bar Regional Rapid Transit Study Update. Brian Pissarro. So I don't see Brian okay. or uh, their consultant here. I'm, I'm not sure what happened. <coughs> They have, uh, we'll probably just kind of postpone it to the next meeting. Perfect. Thank you, Manny. And then, so other business items is the Tampa Bay TMA Leadership Group, March 6, 2020, Hill Garden Inn, North Parkway, Lutz, Florida. Does yeah. anyone like to attend? And then um, MPOAC Weekend Institute is going to be at Renaissance Hotel, International Plaza, from April 17th to the 19th in 2020 in Tampa. Commissioner Moore? Just one, one question for the team and I guess my commissioners is that, um, this happened, I know when I first came on, um, we had a city that's on the MPO board but never participated. We're still there, once again. So I have not seen anybody from Port Ritchie here 
in a number of months. Uh, do, do we know if they ever plan on well, attending? Well, the vice mayor showed up. Last 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 oh, I missed it. Last oh, I yeah. Last he was here. Oh, they did. Okay. okay. An alternate. But I, I okay. have reached out to them once again and said their attendance is <laughs> very encouraged if they want to continue to be a part of this board. Sure. Well, I mean, listen, it, it's important. It, be, it behooves you if, if you want to participate and you want to try to get anything funded, you might want to show up. Might, might want to be here because oh, we're, we're, we're not we're not just tossing money around. And this here. project we're talking about is in the Port of City Limits, so mm -hmm. they're uh, obviously a vital part of it. We, Any, we, we have approached them more than one time, and then all we can do is ask. We can't force them. I can't. Yeah. I think if you stress the importance too, of like they did last time, having an alternate, or and I think that's what they've done. Maybe they know if they can send yeah. someone else if the mayor can. All right, there's anything. So, uh, yes, if you would go back to also, you said you'll kind of come back to item C, action item, to yeah, extend the contract because A, Con needs Yeah, we just did, did that. that. Oh, that was the motion. Yes. Yeah. All right, if there's any, not anything else, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Gracious. I do agree. Just need to get everybody in the summer. Right just, just I'm checking, I'm checking. Right yeah, hey, Chief Artist presentation says March in, says March. I don't think they were supposed oh, to be. Oh, they're not supposed to be. I don't think they were.